I'm Jay Clayfield. And I'm Katerina Costa. This is Spoke TV, your source for local weekly news produced by second year journalism broadcast students from Conestoga College. With the Victoria Park Boathouse coming back, the new owners are looking to clean up one of its more infamous attractions, the bathrooms. Residents would commonly complain about the stalls being used for illegal activity. With the scoop, here is Spoke TV's Joe Dyke. The Boathouse in Victoria Park is making a comeback. But will the illegal drug use and sexual activities be brought into the new washrooms? The new owners of the boathouse are making sure these washrooms are being used properly by closing it off to the public. Steve Godfrey, project manager of Ben Watt Contracting, explains the changes to the bathrooms. These are just for the customers uh, of the boathouse. The uh, new bathrooms that were built just across the street that are quite large and, and quite nice um, are for the park, the individual park users. There used to be a door right here when the bathrooms were made public. Now they're being rebuilt to be more accessible to the boathouse clients. Lorraine Grenier, a resident of the Victoria Park area, has been collecting buckets like these filled with syringes, crack pipes and condoms after she got pricked with a needle while throwing away a paper towel in the new washrooms. The boathouse is going to have some serious problems. Even though he turned his bathroom doors around, that ain't, that's not going to stop them. A drug addict will do drugs no matter what. You can't stop them. Some residents in the area are disturbed and concerned and don't think anything will change with the new washrooms and that there should be certain regulations to keep it safe for park users. The bathroom should have an outdoor bin. Do not put one inside. If you put it inside, they're going to go inside and inject, and that's against the law. And only time will tell what effect these new developments will have to the people that use both the park and the boathouse. For Spoke TV, I'm Joe Dyke. Public transit makes getting from point A to point B easy, efficient, and offers an environmentally and cost-friendly alternative to driving. The Grand River Transit will be making changes in the new year to appease riders. Marion De Palma tells us more. Public transportation is in demand as the region of Waterloo continues to grow. The Grand River Transit invites people of all neighborhoods to join them at one of the many public consultation centers being held in the region this month. The aim of the meetings is to hear what local transit users have to say and what their thoughts are on the proposed ideas for 2015. Eric Pisani, Principal Planner of Transit Development, says the public input is vital to the improvement of the transit service. To test the waters, show people our routing concepts we've developed, just get their general feedback on that and then use that to refine our plans uh, over the next few months so we can come back out in the spring uh, with more refined uh, concept and refined routing plans for folks. Some changes the GRT has approved include implementing a new limited stop route through Central Kitchener and adding a Sunday service to Route 22. They also hope to enhance the 200i Express with new stops and more frequent service. Thomas Choi, a frequent transit user who attended a center, shares why he thinks these public forums are important to participate in. Even though this is going to happen though, there's also other areas where they're going to either improve service or change it. And as university students, we have to understand that whatever change is going to happen, it's going to affect everyone. The public is welcome at various centers throughout November to share and ask questions to regional staff. The 2015 plan will be available for review next spring after approval by Regional Council and should be implemented by September 7, 2015. For Spoke TV, I'm Marion De Palma. Recent allegations against former CBC host Gian Gameshi has raised awareness surrounding sexual consent. Spoke TV's Jeff Pickle takes a look at the blurred lines of rape culture in post-secondary environments. For many, university is seen as a safe place where people can explore their social lives. But evidence would suggest that this is not true for female students. According to a study from the University of Indiana, 25% of rapes and attempted rapes happen while in college or university. Helen Ramirez, a professor of women's and gender studies at Wilfrid Laurier University, says that rape culture is woven into the fabric of our society and has led to an unclear or ignored understanding of what consensual sexual activity is. How many times are young women raped when they're drunk and when they have virtually no control over saying no? We do very little around consent. We don't even know what consent looks like. Now, while rape culture is prevalent on most university campuses, you'd be wrong to think that this is the only place in Canadian society where we tolerate sexual violence towards women. Several of Canada's most recognizable institutions have recently been accused of harboring a sexually violent culture. In many cases, the issue of consent has been at the forefront. As feminist legal professor Rashmi Singh describes, 
the issue is much larger. And we need to do more than just focus on the, that specific issue of consent because I, I, there, it's absolutely important to have but clearly, there are bigger problems here. Both professors Singh and Ramirez agree that the current attention on sexual violence is good, but it needs to result in real action to make the schools, workplace, and home a safer place for Canadian women. For Spoke TV, I'm Jeff Pickle. Education and freedom are something that Canadians know firsthand. However, many flee their countries to earn these two basic rights. Nobel Peace Prize winner Malala Yousafi gives us an idea of what that could be like in her book. Spoke TV's Paula Sierra gets up close and personal with Malala's father. Weakness, fear, and hopelessness died. Strength, power, and courage was born. Bullets couldn't silence Malala, and now her message has been heard internationally. The father of the 17-year-old Nobel Peace Prize winner, Saidin Yousafzai, spoke to University of Waterloo students last week. Yes, it was dangerous to speak. But it was far more dangerous not to speak. As Malala recounts in her book, she was shot by the Taliban for promoting girls' education in Pakistan. In patriarchal societies and the global South, education for girls is emancipation. It is freedom. It's their independence. It's their life. Education is a powerful weapon that changes the world. We're so used to have it that we cannot imagine life without it. But unfortunately, for some, they must move countries and leave everything behind in order to get it. Nasi Yousef, a Waterloo student who was raised in Malala's Valley, says her future changed when she left her country. After moving to Canada, I, the opportunity was even bigger for me. I had, I had the opportunity to not only have freedom of expression, but I had the opportunity to be who I am. This just goes to show that the courage of one girl can empower women everywhere. For Spoke TV, I'm Paula Sierra. Since August, nearly 200,000 people have been killed in the Syrian civil war, according to the United Nations. Fundraising efforts focused on helping Syrian refugees are happening in the Waterloo region. Amanda Din shows us what local residents are doing to help raise funds and awareness. Imagine a night full of family and friends and fun, all being taken away from you. That's what it's like for Syrian refugees. To raise funds for them, Siba al along with others, have organized a dinner at the Trinity United Church in downtown Kitchener. She is part of a humanitarian organization collecting donations for these refugees called Najda Now, which means help in Arabic. Siba has described the conflict in Syria to be comparable to the Rwanda genocide. Up to 7 million people have been internally displaced and 2.3 million have sought refuge outside of their country. Al Qadour describes why her and the group don't want to take sides on the political actions and instead are focusing on helping the refugees. We believe when you want to work in a relief work, when you want to help people, so politics and religion, it has to be to the side. So it's about the humanitarian, it doesn't matter how they are thinking. Leon Kell, who helped organize the event and is the MC of the night, explains where the idea of the dinner came from. He said, what's a good way to um, raise some funds, um, but also make people aware of what's happening in Syria. And so when we talked about it, we said, I think doing a supper would be a great idea. And why don't we expand that a bit and also have uh, some music, some video, that type of thing. To help with fundraising, child refugees from Syria have also donated drawings that are up for bid. Some of these pictures will also be up for display at the Waterloo Regional Museum. For Spoke TV, I'm Amanda Din. Parents always get a warning about saving for their child's post-secondary education, but never about child care. Monthly child care fees can get expensive, and Kitchener is in a middle rank compared to other cities and provinces. The average cost for residents in Kitchener to pay for child care is around $900. Meanwhile, locals in the greater Toronto area have the highest ranking child care costs and could be expected to pay anywhere from $1,000 to $1,600 in a year. The report developed by the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives has shown that a city in Quebec is the lowest paying city for child care and Brampton is the highest. The report is based on a woman's income and does not include unlicensed child care. It's a dog's life and licensing our furry friends is important, but it can be a hassle. The city of Kitchener is revising bylaws that would make it more cost efficient for dog owners. Spoke TV's Kate Leahy explains what's happening. 
Kitchener residents who own dogs and have them licensed know that prices can get high during certain months. Licensing your dog in Kitchener is a bylaw, but only 30% of residents have their dogs licensed. Currently, prices to purchase are set at $27 from January to March and then $74 for the rest of the year. But whether they are purchased in January to March or after, all licenses expire come December 31st. City councillors were presented with a plan to revise the dog licensing bylaw to make it that they don't expire for a full year beginning at the purchase date. Janice Maxwell of Kitchener Waterloo Humane Society explains why the structure of this bylaw should be revised. We're heading towards a more um, responsive pet ownership strategy, and these bylaws will help us to focus more on dealing with animals in distress as opposed to, you know, focusing on licensing all the time. It's just teaching responsible pet ownership. A couple from the dog park explain why they chose to license their dog. We do license our dog because it's part of the bylaw here in Cambridge and we do it just to uh, keep her safe and uh, like just in case she goes missing just to keep track of her. If the plan is passed in City Council, the new bylaw will take effect this January 1st. For Spoke TV, I'm Kate Leahy. Ontario is saying nope to smoke with amendments to the Smoke Free Ontario Act. If your New Year's resolution is to quit smoking, the Liberal government of Ontario is going to be making it easier for you. Following changes to the Smoke Free Ontario Act, January 1st, 2015 will mean that it is now illegal to smoke on restaurant and bar patios, playgrounds, and publicly owned sports fields. The bill is also being amended to forbid the sale of tobacco or tobacco products on college or university campuses. For Spoke TV, I'm Jay Clayfield. Getting ready for the cold season is challenging, but a beautiful snowfall and a hot cup of something is always rewarding. However, drop in temperatures often bring rise in crashes out on the roads. Leah Johansson tells us what we can do to get winter ready with our cars. Winter is coming, but it seems not everyone is seriously prepared for some of the road conditions that come with this chilly season. After the first snow squall passed through the region, over 140 collisions were reported on local highways within an eight-hour period. Many crashes occurred because drivers did not have proper winter tires or were driving too fast for the conditions. In a press release issued earlier that week, Ontario Provincial Police warned drivers most of these collisions can be avoided by adjusting speeds. This year, the Ontario Provincial Police and the Ministry of Transportation are working together to ensure the roads are safe this winter, but it's still the responsibility of car owners to make sure their vehicles are also safe. Eric Ritz travels through the region daily. He says he changed his habits after a rude awakening. Yes, I actually totaled the car three, three years ago, driving in the winter. Uh, it didn't have winter tires on it, and uh, an episode of distracted driving combined together to create a totaled car. Danny Marin, owner and lead mechanic of Marin Auto House, says crashes are at their highest rates during the first few weeks of winter weather. And to happen more often, the first two or three snowstorms we get in the year, uh, people do not get prepared in time. They do not remember how last year was and uh, what it actually is to be on snow or ice. Drivers should also have emergency kits in their vehicles during the cold weather, have their antifreeze stocked, and not follow too closely behind other drivers while on the road. For Spoke TV, I'm Leah Johansson. Coming to us straight from the gridiron, Spoke TV's Josh Horsley takes a closer look at the regional high school football championship against Jacob Hespler and St. Benny's in Cambridge. The lights were on, the snow was falling, and the crowd was cheering at the Waterloo County Secondary School Athletics Association football championship. It certainly is a cold one here at Warrior Field in Waterloo, where the Jacob Hessler Hawks are taking on the St. Benedict Saints. This is the first time that the Saints have been in a championship football game, and they're looking to take the win. The Hawks got on the board first with a six-yard rushing touchdown and then doubled the lead to 14 to nothing on the next possession after scoring a two-yard touchdown. The Saints then narrowed the gap to 14 to seven with a 15-yard touchdown pass into the back of the end zone. In the second half, the Hawks scored two more touchdowns while keeping the Saints to just one. So unfortunately for the Saints, victory slipped from their grasp and they lost to the Hawks 28-7, leaving the Hawks with a perfect 9-0 record for the second straight season. And it just sucks because Jacob's fourth in a row now. It's getting frustrating. The Hawks had extra motivation to win the championship because their regular head coach, Mark Hatt, was diagnosed with cancer last year and was unable to make it to the game. 
Yeah, I'll be texting him in a few minutes. It feels great winning the game for him. You know, I wish he would have been here tonight, but he just simply wasn't feeling well enough. And I think, I mean, we had a poster up in the room, and the kids have a sticker on a helmet. He means him. We're always thinking of him. It means a lot to us. It's two years in a row. This one was for the head coach that we couldn't have with us this year, and that it was all for him. Despite the loss, however, some of the Saints were looking forward to facing the Hawks again. We'll get him next year. Let's go. For Spoke TV, I'm Josh Horsley. And that's all for this week. I'm Jay Clayfield. And I'm Katarina Costa. For more news and information, be sure to check out SpokeTV.ca and follow us on Twitter.